you know, one of the arguments that my, Mark Eiglarsh makes is that, you know, his client, Scott Peterson, wasn't getting, you know, the real-time intelligence that he should have been getting. This was one of the things he told, told me, was that what was being relayed to a dispatch center was not necessarily coming to him. And he says he has the transcript of what was going on during that radio traffic to prove it. So uh, what is your feeling on this and on the arguments his attorney is making? And Jeanette, and I couldn't stop but stop myself from laughing because really it's an absurd argument. And respectfully, Mark, you're wrong. And this is why people don't like defense attorneys. I mean, this is something that is both morally wrong. Like Lisa said, I'm 100% in agreement with her. Um, it's professionally wrong. This is your job, literally. But it's also legally wrong. This is criminal negligence. You have a duty. Now, normally, it's not a duty to act or a duty to render aid under the law. But when there is a special relationship or... Um, a duty imposed by law, there is. And in this particular case, his job is to protect those students. So, you know, these types of arguments that he didn't know what was going on, he didn't have the information. I mean, save it for the jury, because these are bad arguments, and these jurors that hear this case are going to see right through it. It's shameful, and he could have saved these young children's lives. And the fact that his attorney is really making these outrageous arguments and going on the offensive um, is offensive, really, to these students and their parents. Ema, you are the prosecutor here. Let's uh, start with you. You worked as a prosecutor for a long time. Uh, have you ever seen a judge tell a prosecutor in open court, get on with it? You're taking too long. You've gone 150% longer on cross than the, the defense has in its whole case. And Jeanette, I have. And I'm here in Los Angeles, just down the street from where this trial is happening. There's a lot going on in this case, and it's such a unique case for many reasons. We have conduct that spans almost 40 years. You know, we're talking about three murders that are really have no relation to one another. We have a defendant here that is very long-winded, but it, he's also given testimony and interviews many times during the Morris Black trial, during the Jinx, even to John Lewin himself for three hours when he was arrested. So there's a lot of information. But we also have a prosecutor here who has been living, breathing this case for so many years. This cross-examination outline, by his own admission, is 200 pages. And then every time Durst, you know, goes, uh, tells a story, makes another lie, you know, Durst, you know, leads Lewin down these rabbit holes. So really what he needs to do as a prosecutor is to back up, not talk about, you know, you know, Bakersfield and what drugs he was using in the 60s, things that really, they're lies, no question. But they're not relevant to the Susan Berman murder or even the Kathy Durst murder. You've got to tighten it up a little bit because, you know, we're going now about two weeks on direct and cross-examination. And I think Judge Wyndham is right. At a certain point, you're going to lose these jurors who have already committed to sitting on this case for four to five months, but it has to end at some point. So I agree with Wyndham. Um, hopefully, Lewin can kind of wrap this up today, if not, certainly no later than Monday. Yeah, we'll see if the judge gives him extra time. Um, it seems like he's really tightened things up today uh, from what I've seen of the cross-examination. You know, again, uh, this is my former prosecutor side. When a criminal defendant comes and he takes a stand and he admits to perjuring himself and but says it's not a big deal, it's minor or minor, minor, or there was even a point where Durst said, it doesn't count if I lie to you, John Lewin, because you're the prosecutor. That type of perjury is excluded. So really bizarro world here. But you know, apparently this strategy has worked once before for Bob Durst. So he's going to use that same playbook and see if he can convince this California jury, just like he did that Texas jury in the Morris Black case. Yeah, uh, it's definitely felt a little like bizarro world at times during this trial. So there have definitely been some strange well, moments. Let's start with you. Um, you're the former federal prosecutor here. Does Bob Durst have to explain that? Uh, he's saying, I don't have to explain it. That's what happened. Well, he does have to explain. And this all relates to the cadaver, right? He is visiting. He's from out of town for a staycation. So, you know, he has to go buy an envelope, a letter, a stamp and mail. Why don't you just pick up the phone if you walk in and you see your best friend shot in the head? And his explanation is, well, I tried to pick up the phone and the dial tone wasn't working. So I drove two miles away from Benedict Canyon all the way to Sunset Boulevard. I picked up a payphone there. I tried to call 911. A female operator picked up the phone. 
and I thought she might recognize my voice. So I hung up, and that's why I wrote the letter. Doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, and we know how important this cadaver letter is because it's one of the few direct pieces of evidence in this case. And it's actually what prompted him to make the admissions during the jinx when the producers there confronted him with it. So that and the dig note are really the two key pieces of at least physical evidence that allows us to get into Bob Durst's head. So to the extent that Lewin, and he did an outstanding job, tripped Bob Durst up and cross-examined him on that key issue of why did Susan Berman's phone not work on December 23rd, but it happened to work the next day on Christmas Eve and two days earlier, excuse me, the day earlier when you called her, doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. So I really like this line of questioning by Lewin. Bob Durst, you know, one of the first things that comes to mind for me here is that Bob Durst sure likes to write a lot of notes. And I, I just don't, I don't get it. It's very odd. Um, but he didn't really have um, a, a good explanation for these things. And Jeanette, you're right. Bob Durst loves to write these notes. And if he's convicted, it will be because of these notes. But I've been calling it the dig note. But is it the digital note? Is it a snow shovel, not a shovel? I mean, all these things apparently mean something aside from what they say on the paper. So this is, again, something that I think the jurors are not going to like. I mean, it really kind of defies all logic and credibility um, for jurors to argue to this jury that he meant digital and he meant snow shovels, not shovels to bury his wife um, in the town dump or dispose her body along the Jersey Shore or whatever he did. So. This was very, very effective cross-examination. I mean, we knew about the cadaver note because it was litigated at mm -hmm. length, but, but this is something that came out uh, during trial and was really a bombshell for the prosecution. Nima, I want to ask you about that, too. Um, was this effective by John Lewin? Is, is he making Durst look like just, just a liar? Very effective, Anjanette. And I'm thinking to my old you know, Casio digital watch. We're all dating ourselves now, but certainly everything <laughs> right, exactly. was more... <laughs> More or less analog back then, unless you, have, you know, maybe Bob Durst is a multimillionaire and he had the first digital technology. But, you know, both Bridge and Bridge Hampton, I mean, all very, very effective, you know, because Bob Durst is now taking more and more absurd positions and the jurors are going to see right through this web of lies. So I thought this was fantastic. Um, and it was very sort of interesting. You know, we've obviously heard um, that Bob is having an affair with a Mia Farrow's sister or at least is romantically interested in her. Kathy mm -hmm. um, is allegedly having an affair with uh, Jill Biden's ex-husband. You know, uh, Harvey Weinstein is the producer of All Good Things. So six degrees of separation <laughs> here. And somehow all of this is going to be connected. Yeah, it, it's it's definitely a strange, strange web. And I, I'm still wondering, are we going to hear from Prudence Farrow? Probably not. But it would be what interesting in the world. Could the keys, you know, the fact that this is something that Bob Durst includes or incorporates in these stories. What what could that mean? And will this will the jury say, oh, aha, look at it. It's going to be his undoing this time. It means a lot. And we know it means a lot because during opening statement, Lewin kept hammering home the fact that Susan Berman was someone who's paranoid, was someone that cared about security, wouldn't just let a stranger into her house. There was no sign of fourth century. Nothing was stolen. It had to have been her friend. That's why it was Bob Durst that went in there and executed her without her knowing. On the other hand, Bob Durst was saying, I happen to have friend, uh, keys to my best friend's house, and I walked in, and there she was dead. So it's very relevant to the themes that District Attorney John Lewin is making and presenting to this jury. Yeah, it, it does seem really relevant. It's always a part of, of, of the explanation for him. They're in California, right down the street from that courthouse where this trial is going on. Uh, Nima. What do you, what do you make of that? Um, you know, do you, do, what do you think the jury is going to take away from that? Was that effective by John Lewin? And Jeanette, I can't help but laugh because again, it's not something you typically see, but again, this is the unexpected when it comes to this trial. You know, we're seeing documentaries, we're seeing movies, we're seeing, you know, an 11 day examination, cross examination, probably going to get closer to two weeks when there's, uh, redirect and recross. So really, this is a, one for the ages. Um, but, you know, what I see John Lewin doing is going back to his original outline. You know, we talked about the keys and the themes there. And now what he's doing with this line of examination, again, he's not following Bob Durst, you know, down every rabbit hole that we've said. He's going back to the basics, 
talking about these other witnesses who said that, you know, Kathy was afraid of her life and that Susan Berman, the reason Bob Durst killed her is because she was extorting him and she was going to go to the police. So we're getting back to his original themes in the case that he laid out for this jury because we know that he's running out of time and he has to hit these points either today or Judge Wyndham is going to cut him off. Yeah, and, and he was very clear that he's going to cut him off and said they could revisit the issue at the end of the day today. But the, the judge, I think, has had enough. Uh, and I agree with you. It is it is funny at points because we don't usually hear this. I mean, it, it's not funny, but you're going to have funny moments in, in every trial. Um, but we don't typically see this type of thing. Every once in a while, you do. Um, I want to look at another clip, Nima, and then we'll talk about this uh, after it plays. But um, Robert Durst was suggesting on cross-examination uh, that a silencer may have been used when Susan Berman was killed while Durst was at the house. So let's listen to that. Did it make sense to you that Susie was going on a walk without her dogs? without all the facial expressions, makes perfect sense that she would do her walk without the dogs. So, I understand when you first see the door open and you see the note gone, you believe you're saying now that Susie had come home and that she had taken the note, is that correct? Correct. I thought this was very interesting because Bob Durst is the one who introduces uh, the prospect or the possibility that the shooter had a silencer. I mean, this is something he's bringing up. And, uh, you know, I don't know what the laws were back in the year 2000, but don't you have to have like a special permit from the ATF or something to even have a silencer? Especially here in California, firearms laws are very strict. And this is part of the defense strategy. First, they talked about Susan Berman's landlord or her manager having a motive to kill. Now, Bob Durst is saying the killer may have been there, may have killed her with a silencer, may have been parked on the street. So, my you know, question, defense strategy is to throw day. everything Listen, at Mr. the wall. Durst. Hopefully something sticks and we're back in court. So um, let's hear what uh, he has to say. Susan Berman, who is at issue here, that's the most difficult case for the prosecution to prove because there's the least evidence. Obviously, Morris Black is the most because Durst admitted to killing him and mm -hmm. chopping up the body and throwing it into the Gulf of Mexico. And Kathy would be second because of the history of violence and all the statements that Kathy and Bob made about her disappearance. So um, what Nguyen's trying to do is lump all these together so that when the jurors go back in that deliberation room, they say to themselves, hey, we shouldn't have let Bob Durst walk again. Well,